So welcome, thank you so much for coming tonight. This is the beginning of the third year of the Poet in Residence reading series, which I've been so happy and honored to run here at the University of Dubuque. Oh, I have a speech, let me find it. Um, the main purpose of the, the series is really for me to try to bring as many talented writers uh, in all different genres and range of experiences from, so far we've had three or four countries and eight or nine states represented of the people who've come to campus so far, so it's been really kind of wonderful. Um, at UD, we understand that excellence in education extends beyond the classroom, and this reading series is one way that we, at least in the English department, sort of encourage our students to participate in their education, to encounter and consider the experiences of others, and um, kind of just see how they try to transform experiences into art. So that's the spiel. Um, this is the nonfiction edition of the Potent Residence Reading Series, and by that I mean I've never had to read to the same group of people every year <laughs> before, and so um, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm gonna run out of stuff really quickly. I thought I'd stop wearing you out with those morbid poems that you heard last year. Um, but actually, what I really thought I would do is, um, I've always thought of memoir and creative nonfiction as my second language, so to speak, and I've really been interested recently in, in returning to that genre and writing more in it. And I'm working on independent study with Danielle over there, um, which allows me to read essays and think about the genre, have some really wonderful discussions. And so I just have a sh few short essays tonight, and um, they span quite a long range of time. So I'll just start at the beginning and see if we make it to the end. Um, the this is the 15th year I've lived in the United States, which is kind of amazing still to me. Um, it's all right since I left Trinidad, 15 years since I left Trinidad. Um, it's sort of a miracle <laughs> to me, uh, leaving back then, 1997, with no, no idea, no idea whatsoever. And um, I wrote this essay in Iowa years ago, uh, and I thought it would be just kind of fun to share. I've shared part of it here before, but I'm just gonna take up a little bit in the middle and uh, share some of that experience of leaving. It's called How to Leave Home. July 17th, 1997. You get two suitcases, 70 pounds each. That's all, that was back in the day, clearly. You get the biggest ones you can find for the cheapest price you can, and even if they're the ugliest things you've ever seen, you listen to your mother when she says it doesn't matter. So you pick the lesser ISIL, the plain black pseudo leather, having decided that you absolutely could not live with the embroidered floral one, no matter how much easier it would be to spot on the carousel. Only one black one is left in the store, the attendant shrugs, so you wind up with one of each. Fair compromise. For days they are stowed in the back of the house, out of sight, hidden as though the lineup of documents, tickets, passports, scholarship letters, I-20, the piles of books and shoes, the lists of things to do, things to get, things to remember, tacked onto your bedroom wall, the mirror on your dresser, the refrigerator, and not reminder enough that the day is approaching. You are leaving soon. You've been preparing for days running around doing laundry and quick shopping, gathering last minute gifts from friends and family. You've held divorce court with your sister over which stuffed animals belong to whom. You decide to split them evenly based, evenly based on a compromise between actual ownership and misplaced sentimental value. The warmest things owned by anybody remotely your size have crawled out from exile in storage boxes and mothballed dresser drawers to land on your sister's bed in a pile of long sleeves and collars, flannel, corduroy, and other thick, unnameable materials. Each item, the checkered blazer, the maroon shirt, the fuzzy blue bathrobe, the tan turtleneck, has some tail. I had this when I went to Canada, or England, or New York, or nowhere at all. I have no use for it now, so. It's too big for me anyway, so. I just thought, because you share a room, your sister's bed becomes the hub of all this activity. She hasn't slept in it for over a week, and you've been fighting over who takes more than her fair share of covers as you huddle together in one bed, but neither of you sleep in the living room. In the mornings, you wake up wrapped around each other. Some days, you lie and listen to the hiss of her breath as she sleeps. 
Feel the dead weight of her arm thrown across your stomach, her hands clutching your nightgown like a baby. You try to remember those moments during the spontaneous, all-out wars that seem to break out for no reason between you during the day that usually result in her stalking off in tears. When you express concern, your mother says not to worry, it will pass. On the floor beside the bed are your books. You have many and have spent hours deliberating which over which ones stay behind, which must be sent on later, which can be given away. You take none of your 200 or so trashy romance novels, not even one to read on the plane, you've read them all already. You give away Calabash Alley, Smile Orange, and A House for Mr. Biswas. You really hated A House for Mr. Biswas, and reluctantly agree to give your Enid Blyton, Nancy Drew, and Hardy Boy collections to your younger cousins. You feel a pang as you decide that your good books, Wuthering Heights, T.S. Eliot's collected poems, Jane Eyre, can be sent on later, that your chemistry and physics books and notebooks are more important. You do not know that you will later regret that decision, that you will wind up scribbling poems in margins and changing your radiology major to English. In another bundle are your going away presents, which keep growing in size and oddity. Food, pens, books, cards, stationery, locally made jewelry, inspirational plaques, and funny little basket crafts. You are touched by the thoughts, but sometimes wonder what it was about you that could possibly indicate you would like tie-dyed polyester blouses, earrings the color of the national flag, or calabash purses with funny ears. Things you wouldn't be caught dead wearing under any circumstances. You feel mean-spirited and ungrateful, and you wonder why they didn't just give you the money. It would have been certainly more than welcome, and certainly easier to pack. Pack. It is the night before you leave. The last of your visitors are gone, and only the family remains. Mom ready to get down to business, and Ray willing to fetch and carry as instructed. Dad in the kitchen preparing your favorite dinner, dal with pig's tail and rice, avoiding business at all costs and Deborah, listless, trying to look cheerful and feeling miserably. And you, certain there's something you should be doing, but not quite sure what it is. Auntie Marge is the travel expert who knows how to stuff underwear and socks into shoes, wrap packets of your favorite candy into your new sweaters, how to roll t-shirts so they occupy less space. She doesn't know how to deal with the books though. No one has ever needed to take such big ones or quite so many with them before. She talks nonstop about duty-free shops, departure taxes, which lines to get into, how early to get to the airport, which shoes to wear, what not to tell the customs officers, about New York, about how cheap everything is, about how cold the winters are, how the shopping on, is good on Flatbush and Church Avenues, and you try to tuck the facts away into exhausted brain cells. The ugly suitcases are summoned, the smell of their newness unzipped into the purposeful air. They are laid open on your bedroom floor, two yawning, hungry holes in the center of your fuzzy brown carpet. You try to help appease their emptiness and walk back and forth with items as they're called for. The other side of that shoe, that shoe, no, that, not, not that, the other one. You can't seem to get anything right, so you're brushed aside and you hover uselessly. Every now and again, your aunt slips a package of something or other you are to deliver to a cousin, a friend, somebody you never heard of, you try desperately not to resent the loss of precious space. Console yourself with the fact that you can put some things into your mom's suitcase too since she'll accompany you for a short while. Eventually, you are shooed away as Auntie Marge and mom get down to the technicalities of stuffing and tucking. Go help your father get some rest, something. You're tired. It has been a hectic week of visits to family that you have not seen in years. Old teachers, parish priests, the doctor, the dentist, the pharmacy. There were last minute get togethers and lunches with friends from church, from school, from piano lessons, last fet, excuse me, last fets with your crew at club celebs and upper level. There was your own goodbye party, the first party you'd ever been given where your three best friends popped Stevie Wonders, that's what friends are for, into your stereo and surrounded you in a nostalgic circle and you hugged each other and cried. But you cannot go to sleep. You're looking at the knot of the mosquito net hanging above your bed, remembering how getting it right just across the bed baffled you as a child. You're breathing the smell of freshly turned soil and overripe fruit, julie mangoes and cherries, passion fruit and guava, 
tomatoes, and melangeon. You're looking outside into the darkness at the scenery you've known all your life. The mango tree that you just knew housed a monster at five or six that you could have kissed when you came home from surgery and a week in the hospital at 13. That always fascinated you because it looked like it was on fire in the sunset. The coconut tree you watched your father climb, whose nuts were filled with sweet water, whose leaves you learned to make brooms and mats from, whose fruit you grated to make sweet bread, coconut bake, and sugar cake. You walk around, Look at the marks on your wall where you tried to grow faster by measuring your height at least three times a day. See the smudge on the bedhead where you scribbled Lauren and Troy forever and then tried to erase it. You run your fingers along the sticker collection you and your brother labored over for years, remembering how diligent you were at buying candy every day just for the stickers inside. Smile at the pride you felt in knowing exactly how many were posted across the wooden beam. You think too of your red dress your favorite dingy white t-shirts and your comfortable, if bummy, home clothes still folded on your shelf that you've been told have no place in a new life. You turn around just as your mother is about to toss out your favorite nighty, the pink flowered one with a white bow on the neck and a hole on the shoulder. And you scream, no, maybe a little louder than you intended. Her hands freeze midair and there's a heartbeat of silence. Auntie Marge protests, but the weight you only get 70 pounds but your mother looks at you she says we'll make room july 18th 1997 at 7 30 a.m a small pickup truck barrels down the almost deserted southern main road the rustling green stalks of the cane field and the clear blueness of the sky whiz by in an indistinguishable blur of color and quiet at traffic light stops it's possible to detect the signs of stirring taxi drivers pulling into the stands, one or two lone travelers waiting roadside, flagging cars that pass by, the sounds of morning neighbor across fences, coquille brooms sweeping yards, and the creak of rusty gates as early bird stores open for business. The driver sits with one arm slung outside of the window, the other gripping the steering wheel, his jaw tense and his brow furrowed in concentration. The passenger seats, in the passenger seat's other mother who leans against the headrest paying half attention to her aunt, Marge, whose hands move constantly to keep pace with her story, most of which is lost to the wind as it whips through the open window. In the truck's covered tray are two large suitcases, one black and the other a hodgepodge of colors set with large white flowers, both adorned with dancing red strips of fabric tied to the handles. Beside them lie a less imposing heap of backpacks and pocketbooks, another smaller suitcase, and a duffel bag, most of which also wear the red fabric. An odd assortment of four people sit precariously on the non too sturdy boards that serve as benches lined along the backside of the truck. A wiry boy of 17 chatters incessantly, addressing an animated stream of commentary to his father, a man with a placid expression who responds with an occasional nod or rumble. On the right sit two girls. The taller is almost folded in two, her knees high up to her chest, she wears a baseball cap pulled low over her eyes and does not face the rest of the group, her back turned slightly and her head resting against the window facing the cab. She is silent, observing the others from beneath the dark shadow of the New York Yankees and rolls her eyes every now and again at some question or statement issued by her brother or father across the suitcases. But the other girl is most interesting. The voices and silences seem to center around her. She sits facing the open back of the truck her feet just hanging over the edge, her hands gripping the side to steady herself against the jouncing motion. Her dark slacks, long sleeve shirt and jacket contrast sharply with the little brown truck and the casual t-shirts and jeans of the others. Her eyes alternate between a wild darting, as if trying to suck up the whirl of the passing landscape, and vacancy as her gaze clouds over and her eyelids begin to droop. At one point, her eyes fall shut and her hands loosen their hold and her body leans a little too far over the edge of the truck. Her father calls her name sharply and swiftly grabs her jacket. She jerks awake, shrugs off his arm. After a while, the houses, the thick bushes, and lush trees begin to thin into the flat plains of the airport, where the truck finally passes a sign saying, Piaco International Airport, next left. Soon, they pull in front of a drab, unimposing building and stop. The mother turns to tap on the glass, nodding, and making we're here gestures. 
After a brief moment of stillness, everyone jumps into action. Auntie Marge commandeers a cart as the van driver, the boy, and the father unload the luggage. The girl hops out, absently straightens her clothes and hair. The sister emerges reluctantly, jumping to the ground and stretching her long arms into the air. The young woman is agitated at the long lines in the checkout counter, check-in counter. Marge, I knew we should have come here earlier, she fusses to the older woman, who is unperturbed and working her way to the shortest line. Annette, stop fretting, she replies, directing the others to take places in the other two lines. Whoever gets through first, call us. Where did I go? Okay. She turns to the girl in the jacket. Do you have the tickets? Do you have the passports? As the requested documents are produced, she nods her head approvingly. The lines move slowly, but eventually the boy waves as he reaches the check-in counter farthest to the left. The others abandon their posts and move toward him, ignoring the displeased look of the other passengers. The agent checks the two passports as the suitcases are loaded onto the scale. The two women look at each other and cross their fingers. 69.5, 65, 80, 76. These two are overweight, says the agent, stating the obvious. It's those books, Auntie Marge hisses, maneuvering her way to the counter. Listen, miss, she got a scholarship, and she's going away to school in New York, and she had to take all her books, and we tried to keep the limbo, but they're so heavy, and she had to take her clothes. It's New York. It's cold. You know, the agent is unimpressed. But... Looks at the long winding line behind them, nods, attaches the labels to the luggage, we breathe a collective sign of relief and shuffle into the lobby. Well, I guess this is it, the father intones, chest puffed out, a sure indication that a long speech is about to follow. He's cut off by a muffled cry as the taller girl strides off, pulling her cap lower onto her face. Marge moves towards her, but the girl in the jacket intervenes. I'll get it. Her sister turns away at the sound of the approaching footsteps. Hey, says the girl in the jacket, touching her gently on the shoulder, pretending not to hear the stifled sobs. No response. A moment of silence. Don't go. The two words float between the girls for an eternity. I have to. Another moment of silence. Fine, then go. <laughs> Swiping her eyes, she turns and walks back toward the group. The mother tugs her close by the bill of her Yankees cap and kisses her atop her head. The girl resists, then succumbs, wrapping her arms tightly around her mother. At the gate, a flurry of hugs and kisses ensue. Auntie Maud still giving advice. Make sure you go to the right line when you reach. The mother is giving last minute instructions to the other three. Dennis, you have the number in New York. If there's any problems, call me. Don't forget to pay the light bill. You two don't give your father any trouble, especially you, Deborah. And Ray, take care of your sister until I get back. Be good. The girl in the jacket gives everyone a final embrace, then stands apart, hiking her backpack higher on her back. Are you ready? Her mother asks. She nods. They show their tickets and go through, waving as they wait for their bags to be scanned. We'll be in the waving gallery, the boy shouts. Mother and daughter do not speak as they pay their departure tax and walk around trying to find the right gate and arrive just as the plane is being boarded. The gate attendant issues their passes, directs them down the narrow stairs and out of the building toward the aircraft. As they walk, the girl feels the heels of her shoes sinking into the asphalt, already growing soft in the early heat. She yanks each footstep out and continues to move forward, eyeing the parked plane like a finish line. She imagines the trail of prints she must be leaving in her wake, but does not look, afraid she might be tempted to follow them back, afraid she would turn like Lot's wife into a pillar of salt. The mother pokes the girl and points to the waving gallery, shielding her eyes with one hand. Can you see them? The girl remarks that it's too far away and besides there's a glare on the glass. Her mother does not hear because she is busy flapping her arms at the nebulous mass of gesticulating people in the distance, all focused on the line of travelers making their way to the plane. They climb the narrow stairs, find their places, stow their belongings. The girl sighs deeply, a long, relieved rush of breath, and nestles into her window seat. Her mother, too, pauses, leans into the headrest, eyes shut, and whispers, Thank you, Father, we made it. The engine plane hums accompaniment to the murmur of passengers settling in, the scratch of fabric, newspapers rustling, the tick-tocks of the flight attendants' heels, the determined snaps of overhead compartments. A voice comes over the intercom. Thank you for flying, BWIA. This is your captain speaking, and we will soon be departing for John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York. Our estimated time of arrival is, and fades off as the plane readies for takeoff. 
The mother jumps up excitedly and peers over the girl's lap as the plane begins to turn, squinting through the window, still waving. Over her shoulder, she asks Lauren, aren't you going to say goodbye? This is the last. She trails off and shakes her head in disbelief. The girl is asleep. <laughs> September 2nd, 1997. My mother returns home this morning. Take care, love, and be good, she whispers in my ear. She hugs me tight, then disappears through the gate. We have an agreement. No crying, no mushy stuff. And so we both continue to wave, huge smiles plastered across our faces, each pretending not to see the shimmer of tears in the other's eyes. Her bags come through on the other side of the scanner, and for a moment she is distracted, gathering them, tucking the large berry purchased from my sister under her arm. I have to stop here right now to say that bear is alive. Anyway, this is the day I had been longing for, a day I pictured a thousand times, those long nights of penning letters to schools asking for a chance, the day I planned and replanned since the moment I found out about my scholarship, and here it is. In a few minutes, I will officially be living in New York on my own. No mom, no dad, just me and my new life. I will make my pilgrimage to the city, walk in places I'd only seen on television and created in my dreams. Subways, the World Trade Center, Broadway, the Empire State Building, Brooklyn. I will delve headfirst into the magic of the world's most exciting city. I am ready and have been guiltily counting the days until mom's worrying watchfulness boarded the plane back to Trinidad. Yet, the moment I can no longer see my mother's face, I want to run past the security guards and the metal detectors, past the queue of impatient passengers, as fast as my legs can take me. I want to run, throw myself into her arms and beg her not to leave me in this alien place and to take me home. My muscles tighten in response to the surge of adrenaline, fight or flight. My mother turns around just then and our eyes meet. Her gaze reassures me, calms the furious throbbing in my chest, the utterance rising in my throat. I will be fine. She twists the bear and makes it do a goofy wave with its paw. I roll my eyes and smile. I love you, she mouths as she blows a kiss at me, turns and walks away briskly. I look at her receding back, straight as always, and I know she's not going to look back. I turn toward the exit and begin my journey to the place I will now call home. Thank you. And so we'll see if I survive after my sister heard her name like four times in this essay. Hey, um, so when I left Trinidad, it was the first time I left the island. Um, I made up for that since. And I, I've been to 26 countries. And I really have a thing for traveling. It's kind of fun, it's kind of wonderful. Meet people like you guys. Um, and so this piece is, is about not only just traveling, but sort of noticing some really interesting uh, connections in all the, a lot of the places I'd been to. I spent a year um, when I graduated from Cornell running the writing center in Qatar at Cornell University, um, the satellite campus out there. And I did a lot of traveling while I was there to other, other countries in the region. So um, it's an interesting part of the world. And this was a funny story that became an essay that became part of a book, so that was nice. Um, it's called, and those of you who know me will know, What Women Wear, what I focus on in here. One night, a bouncer at a club refused me entry because my head was covered. No covering allowed, he said. At first I thought he was kidding, but as I moved to go in, he did his bouncer thing and blocked the door. For about 10 seconds, I stood there with my mouth hanging open, and then, gathering my wits, I tried to call out to my friends who had disappeared into the smoky darkness. Can I at least go tell them I'm not allowed in, I asked, with attitude. Bouncer number two, feeling sorry for me, whispered to his colleague, and after a lot of nodding back and forth, bouncer number one says, go ahead, but next time, threat. My friends had missed me by then and had come back in time to hear the reprimand. What was that all about, they asked. You wouldn't believe it, I said. The irony here, of course, is that said club was in the state of Qatar, a Muslim country where in the day-to-day -day events of their lives, women are either partially masked, that's their, only their eyes exposed, or fully veiled, and a fine black material covers the entire face. 
When I moved there in the summer of 2006, I was given a welcome packet that encouraged me as a Western female to practice cultural sensitivity. I was advised to wear shirts that covered at least my elbows and collarbone, and skirts that went past the knee, and this in spite of temperatures that frequently go up to 50 degrees Celsius. That's like 120, really hot. So the last thing I expected was to be hassled because I was too covered. Shortly before the night in question, I'd returned from a holiday in Israel, where it's not uncommon to see women in a variety of headgear, from wigs to fancy hats to simple cloth wraps. My mother, who was with me, fell in love with one of these types of coverings. Her head would swivel, often to my embarrassment, each time another woman walked past wearing one, and she wondered over and over what they were called and where she could get one. I discovered later they were called snoods. We were in a small shopping mall in Jerusalem when my mother spotted an old woman wearing a rich purple snood. Before I could restrain her, she strode up to the bench where the old woman sat, and from my mortified distance, I could see the old woman's shock at my mother's crisp, excuse me, and her confusion at my mother's gesticulation. She was circling her head and in, uh, her index finger around her head. I hurried over when I heard her volume increasing. What are they called? The woman, her imperfect English, <laughs> yeah. The woman, her imperfect English capturing only a part of my mother's query, launched into a bilingual treatise on um, the difference between women who know God and others who didn't really know God. The difference, of course, was that those who truly know God covered their heads. Although frustrated that she still hadn't actually gotten a word for the hat out of the old lady, <laughs> My mother was intrigued by what little she'd understood of her explanations. Later, we reconnected with our secular Israeli guide. She asked about the tradition of covering, and Leila informed us that it was the custom among more conservative Jewish sects for married ladies to hide their hair as a sign of respect for their husbands, and because it's believed to be instructed in the Old Testament. Mom turned to me. So basically, it's a kind of hijab. Shh, I whispered, poking her in the ribs. Wrong country. That's Muslim, remember? The idea of covering is not odd in my cultural background. I'm from a small twin island nation of Trinidad and Tobago, where like many other Caribbean islands, the biggest legacy of colonialism is the variety of ethnic groups. The two major groups in TNT, however, are the descendants of East Indian indentured workers and African slaves. The connotation of the headdress is often a combination of religious observance and sociocultural identification. Elderly Hindu women, for example, in their day-to-day -day lives often wear saris and drape a shela, a matching separate piece of thin embroidered silk loosely over their heads. At weddings, pujas, or other religious events, everyone dons a variety of full ceremonial garb, which for the women, young and old alike, involve much more intricate headgear. Practicing Orthodox Muslim women too, both East Indian and African, sport varying degrees of cover from the hijab, which is a piece of cloth draped around the face um, that covers the hair, to the rare covering that shows only the eyes. Women of the spiritual Baptist faith, a heavily Africanized Christian practice common in the Caribbean, also cover as part of their religious observance. Their turban-like wraps often a sparkling white to match their white clothes. The African headdress, however, is by no means limited to the religious, as women who simply wish to identify with their African roots adorn themselves with elaborately tied headpieces to match flowing, vibrantly colored dashikis, or wear simple wraps for daily, ordinary dress. For me, though, wearing a headscarf began simply as a way not to engage with my often difficult-to-handle head of hair. Even as a child, having my hair combed was a terrible ordeal, especially after it had been washed. When the various oils and pomades my mother applied daily to keep it soft had been shampooed away, leaving a clean but unruly mass. I remember sitting between my mother's legs, head bent low as she greased and combed and braided the strands into submission. More often than not, tears streamed down my face. I was a notorious tender head, which is to say the constant tug of fingers and the comb sharp teeth irritated my sensitive scalp and made me howl when I was younger or grit my teeth as I grew older. Even after I began chemically treating my hair when I was 13, I hated the nightly routine of curlers and wrapping. I would often yank the offending rollers and hairpins out in my sleep and wake up in the morning with a liberated nest of hair. I hated the sting of relaxers, I hated the heavy hum of the dryer, and I hated the monthly trips to the hairdresser. 
When I left home for college, away from my mother's vigilant eye and unable to afford the monthly maintenance of my relaxer anyway, necessity brought me back to the handy solution of the headscarf. With it, I could stretch out visits to the hairdresser, let my roots grow out as wild as they wanted. I tenderly braided my hair into loose cornrows and left them in for as long as I pleased. For me, wearing my head wrap was an exercise in liberation from the tyranny of the comb. But no one lets it be that simple. When I was a junior in college, my sociology professor attempted to forbid me to come to class with a wrapped head. In the face of my consistent refusal, she threatened to kick me out of class. Still, I refused, and I went to the Dean of Student Affairs, who concurred that she had no basis to make such a request. She was, however, equally persistent. She changed her strategy to cajoling. After class one day, she called me back and regaled me with a list of negative social connotations. It's a symbol of slavery, she said kindly. You pe your people have worked so hard to get rid of that mammy image. You don't have to be Aunt Jemima anymore. She said that. <laughs> I'm nobody's mommy, I retorted indignantly. Before the smug sad smile could settle into her face, I continued, and you can't tell me what to wear. She didn't have an answer for that, and so the rest of the semester, she only glared at me whenever I wore the scarf. When I moved on to graduate school in Iowa, I experienced quite a bit of culture shock. <clears throat> I was a raisin in a pool of milk, as I like to tell my mother, and wearing my head wrap made me stick out even more. I would walk into a room, and people would just come. It's so elegant, so colorful, so exotic. They declared, how trendy and fashionable I looked. I'd smile and nod and wonder what they would say if they knew that mostly my family found it quite disgusting. My sister, my sister would constantly tut tut and lecture me. It was laziness, she declared. I could not go through life avoiding trips to the hairdresser. My aunt in New York would look at me and say, are you still wearing that rag? I don't remember how I came to my own style of wrapping. There were two layers, the first a purplish cotton sarong that was about two meters long that I twisted and wrapped around into a bun at the back of my head. The second, a two foot scrap of stretchy black material that pulled everything together. I tied it over, secured the bun, and finally wrapped up the loose ends. Sometimes there was a third layer of maybe colorful fabric that I might use to complement an outfit. People would often ask how I did it, and I would launch into an explanation or a demo that would leave them shaking their heads, but I could do it in my sleep. Once my mother asked how I could carry all that weight on my head all day long, and I told her, only half joking, that I felt it held my brain together somehow. Without my many-layered scarf, I felt exposed and vulnerable. It had become a part of me. Wearing it, I felt most natural, most myself. The morning I was due to fly out to start my new job in Qatar, my mother, who had come to see me off, hauled me to 125th Street in Harlem to get my hair braided. It was my first real grown-up job. You are not starting off with that thing on your head, she insisted. I'd been living in the States for about nine years, and for about eight of them, I'd been wearing the head wrap fairly consistently, the same two pieces. When I left it in New York, it was with a pang. The sarong was thin and holy in places. The black stretchy piece was fraying with white bits of elastic dancing at the edges. It was time to put it to pasture. I knew, but I felt as though I was leaving an old friend behind. After a few weeks, a few weeks later in Doha, as my braids grew out, I began to panic. I couldn't find black hair products anywhere, nor I had observed any place I could get my braids redone. The clock was ticking on the current braids, and I knew it would only be a matter of time before I would have to find a solution. I knew of one. I made a trip to the fabric suit, going from store to store, fingering bolts of material in search of the perfect texture. Nothing seemed quite right. Everything was too stiff, too silky, not plain enough, not stretchy enough. In the end, though, despite the fact that nothing matched my old faithful perfectly, I gratefully settled for a decent substitute, a rayon blend underpiece and a black jersey cotton top. I also discovered shalas, an, array, uh, an option for the colorful outer layer because they were sold cheaply everywhere. There were a lot of Indian immigrants in Qatar. When I showed up to work all wrapped up, a colleague joked, gee, you just got here, converted already? Another liked the cool new look. I was just happy to be home. Over Eid break in October of 2006, I traveled to Turkey where women's headdress had become a symbol of the clash between secular and religio-cultural principles. I'd found someone to braid my hair again and was wandering the streets of Istanbul uncovered. The city was crowded. The Eid holiday meant that the Turks too were on vacation and people from the country swarmed to the city. There were lots of headscarves around and as many bare heads. Women who covered are considered 
backward and anti-progress by secularists who want to make progressive movements, like become full members of the EU and join the ranks of the civilized West. On the other hand, traditionalists and conservatives insist that covering is essential to the proper practice of Islam and differentiates between good women and the other kind. The term bandied about in national debate is officially the headscarf issue. Over Reiki in a bar in Sultan Hamid, my Turkish friend Iraz explained that for some women it had become cool to wear a scarf that had become a way to make a statement, a symbol of Turkish pride. But, she notes, the ban also gave many women a good reason to abandon covering altogether. The headscarf issue had even been a point of discussion in fiction. Nobel Prize winner Orhan Parmuk's novel Snow is set in the border town of Kars, where the issue is far from a distant political debate, but was ripping the town apart, and worse, inciting what appeared to be protest suicides by young women on both sides of the issue. In the novel, as in real life, women who wear headscarves are banned from campuses. I have three degrees. I teach at a university. As I fell in love with Istanbul, I couldn't help but wonder what the situation would be if I were to apply for one of the jobs at the universities there. If the question arose, as undoubtedly it would have, what choice would I make? And yet, I had to wonder at the absurdity. Why on earth should the way I do my hair affect or not how I where I live in the world? The answer, of course, is that now, at the beginning, well, the then beginning, of the 21st century, a time that's arguably the pinnacle of human achievement. In too many ways, women remain socially symbolic. What a woman wears determines the perception of her nation, her society, her culture, her community. The covered women of the Middle and Far Eastern tradition remain for the West the symbol of restrictive, undemocratic, fundamentalist systems, while images of celebrities, the ilk of Britney Spears or Pamela Lee Anderson or whoever's current now, are held up in those regions as clear indications of the degeneracy of the West. The tragedy here, of course, is that while battles are being fought over these perceptions, somewhere along the line, women lose the ability to determine what they wear, for whom, and why. In the worst cases, we become enforcers of our own lack of choice. In the best cases, we are able to recognize and remove the filters, and if only for a moment, unburden each other and ourselves of the weight of this symbolic representation. We unveil, if you will. As I was going through security at the gate in Amman, Jordan, on my way back to Qatar from Israel, the female security officer frisking me in the booth addressed me in Arabic, Alhamdulillah. I gave her an apologetic look and said, I only speak English. She was surprised, you're not Arab, not Muslim. I shook my head each time in response and she became increasingly perplexed. So, so what is this? She began to feel above my head, poking at the material wrapped around it with suspicion. Tired, I offered her the obvious. It is just a headscarf. This stopped her in her tracks. Oh, she said. Her hands paused above my head. She stepped back and studied me intently. I stood silently under her scrutiny. Why, it looks beautiful, she said, breaking into a smile. I smiled back. Thank you, and passed on. Um, I'm going to, let's see. So I, I write poetry primarily. It's, there's, there's no question about uh, where my heart lies, but I really find for me nonfiction is a really great space has more room um, than a poem does to to think about to think about things and to really situate oneself. And for me, um, as you've heard, the the essay tends to become a, an outward look, whereas for me, the poems for me are much more internal. Um, this is a fairly new essay, and it's in all sorts of progress because everywhere I send it to, said it's kind of like old news. But I'm a slow writer, so. Um, it happens. And it's about the Occupy movement, which started a year ago, uh, just about, which was also the same time I was buying my house here in Dubuque. And I thought there was something weird about occupying a house and occupying Wall Street. Um, so uh, the spaces we occupy. Oh, you're so sick of this first paragraph. 14 years ago, I came to the United States. <laughs> Oh, um, I was 18 years old and I'd spent my whole life on the small Caribbean island of Trinidad. 
My mother was an elementary school teacher, my father an occasionally employed construction worker. My miracle scholarship was an opportunity we could barely afford, but it was one we grasped at eagerly. With the help of many hands, I spent four years in New York at St. Francis College, graduated magna cum laude, done Scotus honors, and with a ride to graduate school in hand. When the Occupy Wall Street movement started in September, I was less than a month away from purchasing my first home in Dubuque, Iowa, where I had just finished my first year as an assistant prof at a local university. It was a time of anticipation and anxiety for all the usual reasons. I was terrified of taking on a shutter mortgage, a word that seemed too loaded and too grown up for someone who still resists eating her vegetables. Despite my country beginnings, I considered myself a city girl. In my head, the never darkening lights of New York with its clamor and grit and magic was where I belonged. Buying a house in Iowa of all places seemed to imply that I was settling with all the meanings that that word holds. I traveled every single month up to and including September around the country to my friend's wedding in Jersey, to London, to Greece, to West Virginia, to Trinidad. I was nervous that buying this house meant I would be tied down financially and physically, and that somehow I was trading in my carefree youth for 2,000 square feet of solid brick and a backyard. It was a hobby of mine, looking at houses. It was right up there with going into jewelry stores and looking at really expensive diamond necklaces. There was never any real danger that I might buy one. At least there didn't used to be. But after a year in Dubuque, it was time to realize that my circumstances had, in fact, changed. I had a tenure-track job, and my university was committed to sponsoring residency. There was little to no danger that I would suddenly be given notice to vacate the United States. It turned out that I liked Dubuque, with its grid... <laughs> With its grid of verse roads, its stubbornly beautiful bluffs, discomfittingly friendly people, and of course, the majestic Mississippi flowing lazily along its borders. So on that fateful Thursday afternoon, when I clicked on a link for a charming three-plus bedroom brick house built in 1925 with a porch and a sunroom, and subsequently called my realtor to set up a viewing, it was like I'd called an attendant to open the case and let me try on that necklace. My request was met with skepticism. The house was easily more than 5K over than 5K over what I'd been looking at. Outside the area, okay. <laughs> Outside the area, close to the university I'd wanted to live and larger than other houses I'd toured and told my realtor I would rattle around in all by myself. Once I gave her the satisfaction of acknowledging this was all true, she set up the appointment and I was off to see it in a matter of hours. Later, my aunt, Auntie Marge, would say that I called her and told her I fell in love with the door, which was not untrue. But what I actually said was I fell in love at the door. I stood on the threshold, and to my left was a porch furnished with a wrought iron bistro set and the cutest porch swing I'd ever laid eyes on. The door was wood, real wood, sturdy to the touch. I felt safe just looking at it. I stepped inside, and a small foyer boasted a star-shaped mosaic on the floor and a coat closet of the same dark finished wood. <coughs> A glass panel door led us into the living room. I was overwhelmed with a feeling I would later describe to the sellers, who are Don and Marianne Neffel of University of Dubuque, of course, um, as entering a place that had been loved. I wandered through the living room, ogling the fireplace, the French doors, the kitchen with the original cabinets, the seven-layer crown molding, and all oh, the wealth of porches. Three season sunrooms stacked atop each other on the west side of the house, and the light streamed in gloriously. As we left, I told my realtor I just became a really motivated buyer. There was no way that necklace was coming off. <laughs> at this point, I hadn't even spoken to Alenda. All that Friday, I sat around calling banks, Googling stuff about discount points and closing costs and penalties and meeting with students and teaching classes. And by Friday, I had a pre-approval letter on Saturday. I, a friend who had solicited to be my devil's advocate and I went to take one more look before I decided I was actually gonna do it. I think I was secretly hoping that in the 10 o'clock sun, the house would appear shabby or more foreboding, but the cozy homey feel I had reveled in was still there, only this time with a sunnier glow that made me smile maniacally and want to twirl around on the hardwood floors. I, my devil's ad advocate declared if I didn't buy it, she would. So I went off to the realtor's office and signed on several dotted lines. We dropped off the offer together to the listing agent and the waiting began. When the negotiations, then came the negotiations, numbers, conditions, flying back and forth by 10 o'clock that night, we had an accepted offer. Somewhere in the midst of my personal drama, something in the world erupted. The rumbling I'd been aware of at the periphery of my otherwise occupied vision suddenly became too large to ignore. 
and I looked away from mortgage calculations and IRA withholding forms to find Wall Street occupied. I consider myself a closet activist. Okay, maybe not that closet, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Always balancing the tenuous nature of my presence here in the United States with what I can only articulate as a willingness to join any chorus with a cause. In Greece earlier that year, against the prohibitions of our seminar director, I went to St. Dogma Square several times to witness the protests of the Greeks against their economic disenfranchisement. It moved me profoundly to see a people use their voice, their art, singing and dancing to speak out against their perceived injustices. And I knew it was important for me, though I was not Greek, though I could not understand their words, to bring my body to that place to support their cause. Somehow, it was different with the Occupy movement. Subconsciously, I kept it to the periphery of my vision, which was a pretty amazing feat given how it was spreading like a wildfire. Whenever my inner activist pounded against the walls I directed, I read an article or a friend's Facebook note or looked at something on YouTube, but it was rare. And when I did, for some reason, I was determined not to get involved. I didn't really notice it until one day I ran into a friend of mine downtown. We started chatting and she invited me to a sign-making party she and her husband were having. The movement had arrived in Dubuque. I brushed it off with some excuse, and when she volunteered to make me a sign so I could join them later in the park, a voice I barely recognized as mine sneered, come on, Julie, really? She looked startled, but not more startled than I was to hear the words come out of my mouth. We were both silent, made awkward farewells, and then went our separate ways. On the other hand, I got into out bouts of defending the movement, the most memorable being an exchange I had with another friend who was complaining about her financial situation. My inner activist broke loose and declared, we should go occupy somewhere. My friend snorted and said she'd rather work since sleeping in a park never changed anything. I retorted hotly that going to work every day didn't seem to be changing anything either. That's really harsh, Lauren, she replied quietly. And I felt I'd behaved badly, but refused to relinquish my point. How will anything get better if you keep doing what you've been doing? I closed on the house on October 13th, and on the one month anniversary of the Occupy movement, I was in full moving mode. I'd been ferrying boxes from my apartment to the house because I was out of money to pay the $130 per hour movers for anything more than the most challenging pieces of furniture. On October 28th, I turned in my apartment keys, parked my car in my adorable little garage, and entered the space I would now call home. I was both weary and elated. I wandered from room to room, each one littered with my stuff. I went to the living room, switched on the fireplace, sprawled out on the carpet. It seemed so unreal that I would from that moment be living in this place, that it should be mine, mine and the banks. I lay for hours listening to the hush and hum of the house and proceeded to occupy my new home by falling fast asleep. There's a theme here, isn't there? <laughs> it was a long time before I could place the slight niggling that tempered my giddiness in those few weeks of the house. My friends came by, they congratulated me, exclaimed what a catch I'd gotten, how large it was, always implying that there was so much more than one person could or should inhabit. The day it fell into place, I was reading a post that had been splattered across Facebook by many of my friends, and it was a response to a man who claimed to be working three jobs, go to school full time, and was getting by with his family just fine. The implication being that the Occupy folks needed to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, suck it up, and get to work. I am not the 99, his caption read. The response was gentle and keen. I don't want you to have to work three jobs just to get by, it said. And moreover, it pointed out that anyone who had to do those things to get by, whether they acknowledged it or not, were in fact the 99% of the American population getting, you know, unfortunately treated by the corruption of Wall Street practices, by the greed of multinational corporations, by the privatization of healthcare, and the myth of progress we were all falling for. I say we because in that moment I realized the source of my resistance. I was in the throes of realizing my almost American dream. I was coming into the part of my miracle that was promised if only I worked hard enough. 14 years ago, my parents stripped their home of valuables to pay for a ticket to America. I arrived here with $500 on a mission and to make their sacrifices worthwhile. I worked my butt off for over a decade. I had a great job, a car nicer than anything my parents had ever owned, and I was buying this grand, fabulous house that was too big for one person, and I felt as though I deserved it, and that I didn't at the same time. What chained my inner activist was guilt. Who was I to chant and shout the system was unfair? What riled my inner skeptic was pride. I had done it, so who are those people to say that in a time, to have in a time of recession or scarcity was wrong? Either way, I felt a fraud, and could not look Occupy in the eye for fear that it would damn me. 
Since that moment of realization, what's become increasingly clear to me is the challenge of the Occupy movement, that, that, is that the challenge of the Occupy movement is one of understanding where to place oneself in the larger narrative, in the story that's bigger than one's personal rags to refinance option story. Like the guy in the photo, I was so proud to have survived so many obstacles, to have made something out of so little. Like him, I believed I'd been climbing some ladder that was about to lead me out of the pit of the 99, who were now scrabbling at my heels trying to tug me back into their struggle. I believed I had to make a choice about where to align myself. I believed that choice was mine to make. But of course, this is the lie. I have joined the ranks of people living in America who are deeply in debt, whose investments in the notion of home make them vulnerable to foreclosure and bankruptcy. I have a job, but my salary, it's fine, but it's no Wall Street tycoon. <laughs> I thank God I can pay my bills so far, but Suze Orman would probably shudder at the three-figure savings account that constitutes my emergency fund. I am the 99%. But because I have these things, and because I've worked so very hard for them, I want to refuse that reality. Now I think of it, it's probably this revelation, or the revelation of this lie that makes the movement so very successful. It was a year ago, anyway. I can only imagine the disappointment and then the rage I would feel if this hard-won feeling of security was suddenly to vanish. All it would take for me to lose everything, my sweet little Subaru, my cozy brick house, and how little everything really is, would be the recession to taking a greater and greater toll on ourselves, our students, our families. I'm knocking on wood, but it's not a scenario that's entirely outside the realm of the possible. The fact is that despite how hard I've worked for them, my used car, my beautiful character-filled house, my modest and steady income, do not put me in the same class as the 1%, not even close. The fact is there is no threat in a movement whose goal is that more people should have an opportunity to have the same things I do. Nothing that I am so fortunate to have should be my special purview. The fact is the rhetoric of self-sufficiency and upward mobility, the American dream and success stories imply that the failure is ours if we haven't had the gumption to work hard enough, the smarts to make it, when really we're in a system that's stacked against us. The fact is that my defensiveness of my humble possessions, and let's face it, they're not really mine yet, is precisely the point at which communication around this issue breaks down. To say what we have is enough denies the growth structures of economic inequality that allows some people to spend a month more more in a month than others could earn over the course of several years. But to say what we have isn't enough puts everything at risk, and any risk risks everything we have. And so where to go from here? It's not immediately clear. My family is beside themselves with pride, and even my inner activists can't resist the pure joy that erupts every time I walk into my beloved front door and turn the key. Even the chores have taken on new and welcome heft. I am awash every day with gratitude and a deep fulfillment. Meanwhile, the Occupy movement keeps pressing on as the systems of power push back with increasing force, summoning riot gear and tear gas to do their sinister work. It becomes clearer and clearer that what's at stake is our very sense of personhood, to which things, ideas, and spaces are we, we poor, we middle class, we men, we women, we working, welfare, you name it, entitled. What homes, what bodies, parks, privileges, prejudices, what construct of who we are can we and do we choose to occupy? And who built them? And who benefits from them? Who wants us stuck in them or moved out of them ASAP? I don't know that I have the answers for these questions, but they are the one I've begun and continue to think about, which is one of the many positive outcomes of the movement. Ultimately, I think the truest strength is that it's a movement for, by, and about people. Whether or not Occupy can triumph over the vast machines of corporations remains to be seen, but it continues to make visible the extent to which our pursuits of happiness have been co-opted by a system that tells us the pursuit itself is happiness. So we work one, two, three jobs. We deprive ourselves of essentials and simple pleasures alike. We squirrel away what we can, if we can, we suck it up, we face our odds, we cherish our small triumphs when they come. We look at those up top and say, if we keep doing this, we will get there and push ourselves harder. But the movement, and perhaps more importantly, the response to the movement reveals the fine print clauses of that particular contract. The top has no interest in us joining them. 
Moreover, it is our daily persistence that creates the foundation upon which their ease is built. That's why Occupy is a threat, not to us, but to them. By holding fast to our goals of aiming for the top, we're endorsing the equities that maintain an economic top and a bottom, basically saying we're fine with inequality as long as we are the ones who have. And last but not least, it reveals how helpless we actually are, how tenuous our hold on our own success stories are, despite the common narrative of our destinies being our own to shape and build. An example, the son of the previous owners of my house was arrested for photographing the movement. Despite his press pass, he was doing his job. He was thrown in jail for several hours. A picture of the arrest, his face slammed against the floor, his phone and glasses askew, circulated the internet. The message, as long as we act within our hamster-like roles of daily labor and modest goals, we are tolerated or humored by the systems of power. But any movement out of line and what we assume to be our fundamental right becomes a handout from power that will be yanked away. Occupy's triumph is that it's shaken masses of hardworking, decent people out of the deep slumber upon which power relies to maintain its insidious gas grip. We are tugging back. I was driving back from the grocery store one afternoon when I spotted five or six men standing on the corner of Washington Park and Main Street downtown holding signs. One read, Occupy Dubuque, and another, honk if you hate corporate greed. All of our hands are useful. I waved and honked my horn all the way home. <clears throat> I'm done, almost. I'm a poet, I can't help myself, but sometimes they blend together, the poems and the prose, and this is a prose poem, uh, just something to end on. Arrival. You look at the ocean, oh, I should say I wrote this uh, when I arrived in Greece. You look at the ocean, it's fathomless blue luminous. You look at the brown mountains rising like fresh bread, swollen with some livingness, ready to be bitten into. You are in Seraphos, and you are not in Seraphos. The blue of this water its own, but calling from you so many other waters. Maracas, the Bosphorus, the Gulf of Persia, all lapping at the shores of your memory. You have so many mountains inside you. They are your bread, the food of your soul. Seraphos is Seraphos, and every island that has come before it. Seraphos is Seraphos, and every wave of blue. How everything belongs to something else, nothing untainted by memory or the experience of what has preceded it. How it is impossible to be just one thing in this world of so many entrances, so many openings falling one into the other. A hibiscus blooms at the Benaki in Athens and another answers at the gates of the house your father was building in Trinidad in a small village surrounded by cane, which is disappearing eaten up by cement and new roads. Even the ruins of the untilled land will soon be gone. Your father no longer lives in that house where the hibiscus has been replaced, first by buttercups, then by ginger lilies, then a topiary of green. But Greece calls and answers, and it is here. And I'll end there. Thank you. Actually, I ended there because the printer apparently didn't print the last stanza, but that was a good ending, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Q&A part of the night. Do you have questions or comments or anything? I'm going to drink water while we think about it. First, thank you so much for the compliment. And second, um, gosh, I actually just got done lecturing about point of view in my creative writing class. Um, and I, I make the claim all the time that it's the first decision that the writer makes because it's critical um, how you experience the story, voice, and uh, the point of view. 
is what gives the reader an entryway, right? Who, whose story are they inhabiting? Um, so as much as I say it's a choice, it's not really. I, I, it happens for me. I, I change sometimes, but more often than not, I find that I change from a third person because I'm distancing then to an I, but then sometimes I just leave it there. Or And, and the U is new. Um, well, I guess it's not that new because that's an old essay, but it's only recently that I've, I've gone back to that and, and trying to do the U, which can be both. It's you speaking to yourself, and I do that a lot because, as you now all know, I live alone, so I talk to myself all the time. Uh, and it apparently shows up in my writing <laughs> as a second person. But I, I would say it's not a decision. It's really more about the, the angle of distance that I'm trying to get from whatever it is I'm trying to talk about. And sometimes I want to be really close and in the eye. And I'm certain of what I'm going through. And then the other is like a little bit more, you know, you kind of back off the more distant. The, does that make sense? Um, the, I think I would say the first person is the most intimate voice, but I think what you does, you know, you say that, right? We talk to our students all the time about it when you, you know, circle at you, who are you talking to? Um, but I, I feel like it's the step out where you have access to how you feel, but you also have some distance from who you are. Does that make sense? So that's kind of how I think of you as somebody who knows all about me, but isn't exactly me. Who is me? <laughs> Yes and no. So the question is, if, if when I'm writing, I kind of go back to the place. And I think for me, writing does two things. Um, hmm. Am I in the place? I feel like I'm not in the place. Again, it's that, that slight distance that you need to not. I feel like when I'm in the place, I'm in the place. You know, I'm, I'm there. I'm like, ooh, that was pretty. Um, but writing about the place requires me to, to look at the place from a different just a little bit of distance where I can not just be in the rush of experiencing and all, oh, and this is wonderful, and you feel stuff, but you're running around, you don't have time to think about what that is. But then the distance of writing, and in this case, sometimes years later, you can really go back to the more, less the place and more the, the feelings of, of, the, of the place and try to recapture that. So I don't feel like I'm back in Greece when I'm writing about Greece, but I, I'm summoning that feeling that being in Greece gave me and writing about that. That makes sense. Good question. Okay, well, we can do all the question asking off. Oh, there's a question. Yes. <laughs> I do, I do. Um, the, the essays so far are pretty chronological, that's, that's true. But I think that's more a function of just the story I'm trying to tell. I, as, as you know, I'm really interested in form that messes around with time and tense and, and uh, Joanne Beard's, cause, like, you know, there are wonderful essays out there that do that. I just haven't written that one yet. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> I have nothing against those, I just haven't, they haven't been summoned yet. Thank you so much for coming. I have to make a pitch, one more pitch. Next month, uh, November 1st, Roxanne Gay, who is just awesomeness personified. She writes for The Rumpus, uh, which is a wonderful online zine, and um, she will be here. And then in December, Marianne Shuke, our, one of our uh, English adjuncts, will be reading as well. So there's a lot of cool stuff ahead. See you back here, same time, same place. Thank you.